Great, thank you. Um, for those of you who are watching the recording, I just introduced myself. I'm Karen Goodfellow, I'm the Director of Public Art, uh, and welcome to the August meeting of the Art Commission. I am joined by the Art Commission staff working within the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture, Sarah Rodrigo, Public Art Project Manager, and Trisha Gilrain, Collections Manager, who will be helping to facilitate this meeting. I'll now hand it over to Chair Mark Pasnick and Vice Chair Aqua Holmes, who will be calling the meeting to order and going over some further instruction. Sorry. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm uh, Mark Pasnick, the Chair of the Commission. I'm joined by Aqua Holmes and the other commissioners um, at this public hearing, uh, and I call it to order at 4.08 p.m. Uh, today, the Boston Art Commission will be holding its August public meeting. Next slide, please. Um, I will now take a roll call of the commissioners to confirm a quorum. After I state your name, commissioner, please say here. Make sure you unmute yourself first. Uh, so, Aqua Holmes. Here. Camilo Alvarez. Here. Michael Canizzo. Here. Next slide, please. Uh, Cara Elliott Ortega. Here. George Fifield. Here. Robert Freeman. Here. It appears that we have a quorum. Um, uh, and uh, now what we'd like to do is present a little bit of information uh, and instruction on using this platform effectively to offer questions and comments. So this is for the public in particular. Um, to briefly explain, um, this is the procedure uh, for making public comment. Uh, project partners and members of the public will have an opportunity to ask questions and provide public comment on items the commission will vote on. After presentations and commissioners clarifying questions, the chair, myself, and vice chair, Aqua Holmes, will invite public comment. Please remember to keep your comments on topic and to two minutes or less. More detailed instruction will be provided later in the meeting uh, where in the section where public comment will be uh, uh, permitted. Uh, we will be following the publicly posted agenda, uh, which you will see on the next slide. Um, as you can see uh, on the slide, the publicly posted agenda will begin with the director's report uh, in a series of steps through the director's report. And then on the second page of the agenda uh, is the portion uh, for presentations for review, public testimony, and commission vote. Uh, next slide. We will now review the meeting's minutes from the July 14th meeting of the BAC. Are there any comments or modifications any commissioner would like to make at this time? Okay, hearing no comments. Uh, is there a motion on the floor and a second? Uh, I'll make a motion that we accept uh, the minutes from 71420 as they stand. Thank second. you. Yes, uh, and that's seconded by Camilo. Just yes. Great, thank you. Uh, all those in favor, I'll just read your names off. Um, Aqua Holmes. Yes. Camilo Alvarez. Yes. Michael Canizzo. Yes. Cara Elliott Ortega. Yes. George Fifield. Yes. Robert Freeman. Yes. And I am yes as well, so the motion passes. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we will now have Karen Goodfellow give her We're going to start with May This Never End by Matthew Hoffman. Um, this work was originally commissioned by the Rose Kennedy Greenway. Next slide. Uh, because of its temporary nature, it was originally scheduled to be on display until August 2019. The city's definition of short-term installations means it does not generally exceed display of 18 months. Um, and we should note that this work was not ever formally accessioned to the city's art collection. Um, next slide. Uh, the piece has incurred recent and consistent vandalism. During the summer of 2019, we saw incidents of vandalism and again in May and June of 2020, uh, there were multiple incidents. And at our June 9th meeting, um, we, uh, we addressed this as well, and we recommended that a conversation regarding removal and relocation could be addressed at a future meeting. So we're returning to that now. 
Uh, the artist, Maggie Hoffman, has been notified of all accounts of vandalism, including the arranging of the letters to spell Black Lives Matter more recently, and he, he didn't um, display any approval or disapproval of the arrangements, um, but we did share with him that given the consistent vandalism it's been incurring that we would be planning to remove and potentially conserve. And we have been engaging conservative throughout this process. Next slide. Um, the vandalism has continued throughout July and these images were taken on the evening of July 28th. Uh, as you may recall, this is MassDOT property. So uh, we worked with them. Tara actually has been working, um, continuing throughout, throughout this project from its inception. Um, in order to have this installation happen. Um, the artists and the conservative continue to be engaged in these next steps. And people have also been adding artworks to the mass stop fence, as you can see on the, on the left image. Um, mass stop is requesting that we remove everything from the fence, including the new artworks. And so I'd like to open this up for discussion uh, and recommendations. Um, we do think that this piece has been um, itself so damaged. Um, that we would recommend removal and storage and engagement with the artist for recommendations for um, uh, what to do with it or for disposal. So I don't know if anyone has any thoughts or anything they'd like to share or Car, if you have anything to add from any discussions you've had. Um, no, I don't, I don't think I have anything to add. I mean, it's definitely um, suffered a lot of vandalism. I don't know. Um, I, I mean, I think like, it, we've heard this from Matthew, right, that the material itself wasn't really made to withstand this kind of um, cleaning and like recleaning yeah. over and over again. It was always meant to be a, a temporary work and not to be like a permanent outdoor piece. So I think maybe it's it's kind of lived its, its life, but I am really concerned about how, um, because it was rearranged to say Black Lives Matter and people have started adding things to the fence, I don't think that we could just remove this without having some kind of explanation on site. Um, so I think if there's a way for us to do that with MassDOT, that would be my preference, um, that we have something that's put up. Um, and also, I'm not sure how we could communicate with the folks who have added things to the fence. Um, but if there could be some time for people to, to pick up their work or for us to relocate things, like any way that we can engage on that so it doesn't just disappear overnight and people don't really know what's happened. I wonder if the material that this is made of, would it, uh, and, and the condition, would it make sense to move it to an indoor space and maybe partner with the school and allow their art students to play with these letters, um, repaint them and install them inside uh, to whatever message they feel compelled by right now? Or is it so damaged that uh, it has to be just thrown away? Uh, we can we can certainly ask the artist. Um, Trisha, you've been in touch with him recently, right? Uh, can, yes, I've been keeping him in the loop throughout the entire process. So we can ask him if we could do something like that, um, share them with schools if, if they might be interested. I, I think that's a wonderful idea, and and um, Boston Arts Academy comes to mind. Yeah, yeah, that would be amazing. I was wondering if the artist had expressed any thoughts at all on, on what he um, perceived as a next step or possibilities. Yeah, chain link fence is so ubiquitous in an urban setting that I wouldn't be surprised if there is another location where it wouldn't be vandalized as often. And where, you know, definitely an educational setting would probably be ideal. Mm -hmm. cool. So yeah, let's look into that. In terms of returning the artwork, um, it might be a nice first step to maybe feature it on the arts and culture website um, so that people can really see it. And then maybe we can connect with the people who made it that way. But at least um, people in other parts of the city would get to see the artwork that was added on to this particular installation. And that's an easy, you know, easy step. Okay. Uh, well, Karen, would we we wouldn't be involved in the additions of artwork at all, correct? I mean, they, they've already they're already there. That's not in our purview. 
to say yes or no to removing? Well, it's it's not our property, so it's it's not in our purview. But we can certainly communicate with them okay. with MassDOT. I'm talking about the uh, informal artworks that have been uh, amended to it. Yeah, we, I would just be really worried that MassDOT would just remove that without um, trying to do anything else with it. Uh, you know, I just don't. I think we should probably think about our responsibility around it, even though technically we're not responsible for it. Okay. Have we ever have we ever seen that before? Um, artists adding to a piece that's in the landscape. This is the first time that I've seen something like that. I'm just curious. I mean, people put pieces up on their own all the time, but in terms of adding to an existing artwork, nothing is coming to mind immediately. I don't know if anyone else can think of anything. Um, First, I have to say that there's all the additions to the Robert E. Lee statue in Richmond and <laughs> other places that were not pleased with the work, but still added um, their own artwork to it. Okay, well, um, if there are no other comments from commissioners, I wonder if we have a motion. Um, Cara, would you consider making a motion? Sure. Um, I would suggest a motion that we try to find an educational home for the artwork pending approval from the artist and that we reach out to MassDOT about communications around both the removal of Matthew Hoffman's artwork as well as um, the additional pieces that were put up. Okay, do I hear a second on that motion? I'll second that. Okay, all those in favor? Uh, Aye. So I just say, state your name as you go. George? Aye. Aqua? Aye. Camilo? Yes. Uh, Michael? Yes. Uh, Bob? Aye. Cara? Yes. Uh, and I'm a yes as well. So uh, the motion passes. Okay. So next slide. Uh, next up is Emancipation Group. Um, so we'll share some updates regarding uh, this piece. Next slide. Following the commission vote on June 30th to remove and recontextualize the monument, the BAC staff began to arrange for temporary signage at the site. Signs were placed there on Monday, July 27th, and there are two signs and three sets of them uh, were placed around the perimeter of the monument. Next slide. Uh, on this slide, you will see the text of the first of the two temporary signs that were placed at the monument and will remain there until its removal. Uh, the signage provides information regarding the work itself, historical context, its history as a replica uh, or recasting, recent discussions surrounding the monument, current actions including public testimony and BAC vote, and plans for determining the future of the site. Much of our intention uh, with the signs is to help people understand that there was a fair and public process. Next slide. Yep. And here's the second sign of the two temporary signs placed around the monument. Okay, and um, next slide, thank you. Uh, the bid for a uh, conservator to oversee the documentation, removal, and relocation um, was uh, posted on the city's website. The bid application closed after two weeks and we had uh, two applications submitted. Staff is reviewing the applications and will uh, be selecting a qualified conservator and awarding a contract hopefully within the next month. And we are working on, uh, we'll be working to digitize emancipation group files and gather pertinent information from other departments and organizations regarding the monument for comprehensive documentation. That's been ongoing work. Uh, staff will also work with the selected conservator to further document the artwork on site and will work with the conservator to also develop a feasible timeline for removal and verify that the storage facility will achieve appropriate security and environmental standards for the temporary housing of the piece should we not uh, have a new location um, at that time. Next slide. 
Um, we did form two subcommittee groups. I know it hasn't been very long and we haven't had a lot of time, but I did want to um, make mention of this. Um, we had a, a subcommittee group on event. Um, so an event subcommittee group was including uh, commissioners Camilo Alvarez and Aqua Holmes. The commission expressed an interest that this subcommittee address virtual programming and speakers, including youth speakers and other student engagement. The event was conceived as a way to initiate community engagement around the future of the site as well. Um, the recontextualization subcommittee includes commissioners Robert Freeman and Camilo Alvarez, and will consider the future of the piece and the current site. Um, the commission expressed that this subcommittee uh, in the future site, this um, subcommittee should also consider public engagement around the movement of the statue. Uh, it is early in this process, but I'd like to offer a moment if anyone from the subcommittees would like to share any updates. I'd, I'd just like to say it's, it's very early in the process and we are uh, designing uh, invitations for members to join our committee, our subcommittee. Um, but we probably won't hear back from them until the end of August, and we would then start meeting in earnest uh, sometime in September. Yeah, I was going to say something similar. Um, we're, we're getting up and running on this, and some of it is related to the contract for the conservator and sort of the strategy for how that's going to happen. But I, I did have a question about the conservator um, we got two proposals. Does that seem very low or is that what you expected? I'm curious about that. I'm also curious about if the uh, conservators are Boston based um, and what are the possibilities for internships, things like that, that might extend the reach of this project to some of uh, our young people. Sure, Trisha can speak to how many we usually get. I don't think it's unusual for us to get two. Mm -hmm. It's um, certainly a very specific field. Um, they're both local. I don't think, I know one of them is in Watertown. Trisha, do you know where the other one is based? Um, I believe she's Boston based, but it could be Cambridge. I would have to check on that. I, it might be Cambridge, yeah. yeah. Um, but we can also ask them about um, uh, your question about mentorship. Um, yeah. I don't think that's something that we had been looking for before, but um, I mean, that's just my opinion. I don't know what yeah. the other commissioners think about that, but in terms of uh, this whole idea of equity, there are some fields that do not have representation from groups of pe people of color. And so I wonder mm -hmm. if as we're awarding contracts, we might think about that as part of what we're asking or suggesting. Yep. Okay. Um, I reached out to Tori Bullock the, pre the progenitor of the petition today. And we had a, about a 10 minute conversation and I told him about giving him an, uh, this, that we had created these subcommittees and to see if he would be interested in participating in either of the subcommittees. And he's gonna think about it. Oh, great, good. I have a question also about the conservator. When we first started talking about this, there was discussion about um, a virtual a scan, a 3D scan of the whole sculpture and pedestal. Is that, was that also in the, um, in the uh, oh, yes yes okay good the comprehensive digitization and uh, information on the emancipation group emancipation group will that be then placed online I think we've been talking about a database for the collection mm -hmm. and would that be available to us prior to maybe the subcommittees uh, organizing the event and recontextualization so in order to kind of have us all yeah. more better informed. We can, we can share with you what we have now, for sure. Great, great. Mm -hmm. um, also, I'll add, I've been in conversation with Historic New England, um, which is you know, a professionally run archive about sharing archival material. They have many photographs of emancipation group from um, the early 1900s and the late 1800s, um, and that they uh, were discussing whether they would be willing to share those with our archive, and then in reverse, we would also uh, potentially share content um, with their archive, uh, you know, and it's a great resource for scholars to be able to get at information in a permanent archive um, that's run professionally by an organization like them. Uh, and that would include, I believe, the 3D um, material that they have digital uh, archive capabilities. Okay, uh, next slide. I think we can go to the next. 
Um, and so we also did just want to share um, on this slide, you'll see a feedback form, which we have on our website. So if you, you see down there, boston.gov slash emancipation group, if you go there, you can um, click on the, the icon that offers you to give feedback and you'll come to this form. Um, the, in this place that we're uh, welcoming community input and feedback as we're examining uh, equity and representation in the city's art collection through public dialogue, but also uh, through online input. And after unanimously voted to, voting to document, remove, and study the statute to a place where it can be better interpreted, the Art Commission is now seeking ideas and comments for how that could be, could be done. Um, you've heard a little bit about how we're forming subcommittees, but we are still really welcoming public, public comment into this as well. Uh, we request that you share potential sites for relocation, ways to recontextualize the artwork, and suggestions that you have for new artwork. Um, so please, um, if you are interested, take a look there and share your thoughts with us. Okay. Um, so next, um, like many members of the Roxbury community, we were all very saddened to learn of the loss of Ricardo um, Dean Five Gomez's powerful and inspirational mural. Roxbury Love, which was demolished last week without notice, or actually time is escaping me. It was demolished without uh, notice being given to the community. And I think Mark and Aiko, I don't know if you wanted to share um, some of the, oh, Aiko, I think you might be muted. I'm happy share your to thoughts. Um, yeah. read that statement that I guess yeah. is going on our blog. If you can pull up that slide, please. This this is definitely my neighborhood. It's two streets over, and I remember you know driving by for the first time and not seeing it there, and it sort of felt like a little bit of a kick in the stomach because uh, these landmarks speak to us every day um, in a soulful soulful kind of way. But uh, Mark and I had prepared a statement. I don't see it yet. Can you pull that up, please? I think it's the next slide. So we have it, um, no, we have it in the, in the notes, Aqua, do you want me to, here, I'll email it back to you. And this is a beautiful, beautiful portrait of Nelson Mandela, just beautiful. Give me one second. Oops, it's not that. Well, you know what? I can just wing it. Um, I okay. think we, st we started hey, hey, by- Do you want me to read it? Oh, oh if you have it up. I was okay. gonna say- And then you can cut me off once we get to uh, <laughs> once you get yours. But um, this is a statement Aqua and I worked on on, part of, on behalf of the commission. So while murals are often temporary artworks, at their best murals act as a reflection of a city's inhabitants, culture, and concerns. Murals remain one of the most meaningful and influential aspects of urban living. Roxbury Love was a beacon of pride, a reflection of empowerment, and a visual embrace to the community of Roxbury and its visitors. This iconic and now lost symbol deserved a better, more celebrated ending. We are committed to supporting the creative energy and professionalism of our artists and arts community. The Boston Art, art Commission has been in conversation with Ricardo Gomez to determine next steps for replacing Roxbury Love at a dedicated site. We encourage the developers to work with us the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture, members of the community, and the artist to ensure that the public art they committed to in their public benefits agreement is created with and for the community. We are also changing our approach, our own approach, and have adopted our percent for, adapted our percent for art policies to include funding for murals. We will continue to develop new policies surrounding murals and their removal, expanding requirements for community outreach, accountability, and respect for the creators of public works of art. In these ways, we hope to learn from the current moment and together build an art collection that is more fully reflective of our aspirations and values as a city. And just to add uh, this one thought that sometimes we begin with something that is temporary 
but because of the investment and love that a community uh, connects with a piece, it becomes a longer term prospect. And that is, uh, I think that's something that we're moving towards as well, not seeing murals as uh, something to be destroyed or painted over, but that really has a place in our culture and on our landscape. Thank you. Sorry about the confusion about the text. Um, I'm just going to go over some long-term projects. Uh, as we continue to expand our commissioning programs, we thought it would be informative to give the commissioners and the general public um, the opportunity to share current project status for all the commission long-term projects, which are for five years or more public art projects. Um, so we're looking at short-term as 18 months or fewer, and um, we define um, long-term as those lasting five years or more. So um, you can see here in the long-term projects overview um, that our um, projects are organized by the project phases we use for BAC reviews and for contract payments. We currently have one project in fabrication, the JP Library Curtis Hall BCYF project, which we'll share more information about in a moment, and two projects in final design phase and two projects in preliminary design phase. So those projects in final design are the Roxbury Library Clear Story and uh, Hyde Square Public Art. Um, and in preliminary design, we have Vine Street, both the exterior and the interior. We also have three projects whose contracts are almost complete, both the Boston Arts Academy projects and the DeWitt Playground project. We have one project that has completed artist selection, which you'll be reviewing and voting on later at this meeting. And we're just starting the artist selection process for the Ruggles Corridor Integrated Public Art Project. And we actually might um, need um, one or more of you to assist us with that. Um, and we also have four calls to artists in the next two months, and we'll share those with you. Um, for the calls to artists we have coming up, um, we just released a call for the Roxbury Branch BPL. This is the second public art commission for this site. The site uh, is the entrance of the newly renovated library. So this is not, this is a, a new entrance. It's different than it was before in the, the old layout of the library. And this is a call to artists to create a permanent artwork for the Roxbury branch of the Boston Public Library. And the themes uh, include the recent renaming of Nubian Square and the African American collection at the library and the concept of economic justice. The budget is $150,000. The call opened on Monday, August 3rd, and it closes on Wednesday, September 9th, and it's open to all artists uh, with a strong preference for artists with a connection to Roxbury, and we'll select one artist or team for this commission. And we will be having, having online a virtual question and answer session on Wednesday, September 2nd at 6 p.m., and we welcome written questions about this call until September 2nd. Information about this, I think, should be getting shared through the chat. Uh, for anyone interested in applying or in sharing the call to artists. The next uh, call we have out is for the Adams, or, or coming out is for the Adams Street branch of the Boston Public Library. Um, the new building for the Adams Street branch is currently under construction and will feature an expanded children and adult section, a teen section, a community room, a conference room, a music room, and an outdoor reading garden. And we are uh, expecting to release that call on August 17th and close it on September 23rd. The Northern Avenue Bridge Public Art is another uh, call to artists that will be released in September in preparation for that call, um, which is the bridge that crosses the Four Point, a bridge that crosses the Four Point Channel. We hosted a successful community meeting on June 30th and we've collected comments about the artwork for the bridge via email. You can see a screenshot from the meeting in the top right. We plan to continue to do this kind of virtual outreach for other future calls and the bottom two images are renderings of the new bridge shared with us. Um, by the project team and our colleagues in Public Works, uh, with whom we're partnering on this project. And we have three possible sites that you'll see in this next image. Um, this is a really unique project for us in that it's, it's over a bridge. Um, the site gives you, uh, this map gives you a better idea of where the possible locations are. So we're looking for one artist or one team, but we have three you know, potential locations laid out. Next slide. And finally, we have City Hall Plaza coming, um, and that call will be coming out um, in early September. And this is for a signature artwork to complement the renovation of City Hall Plaza. The project is a bit different than our typical work, as a plinth for the artwork is provided as part of City of the Call, 
And you can see the site selection here with a sculptural placeholder at the north entrance, which will be restored to full functionality as part of the renovation. Okay, next slide. I mentioned that one of the public art commissions is in fabrication phase. Matthew Hinsman's new artwork, Width and Web, is tentatively scheduled for installing starting in late September or early October. I want to share a small update on the design. You may recall his project, which will engage the entire front lawn area of the JPBPL Curtis Hall BCYF campus. He'll be installing the cast bronze lawn chairs, as well as low walls or foundations that employ glazed brick. Um, he shared this plan earlier this year when he presented, and that included the possibility of including a gravel pathway connecting the new entrance through the front fence and the ramp entrance near the BPL. He also hoped to include a kind of landscape material in one of the chair areas to better accommodate wheels than plain grass might. Um, however, the paths ended up cost being far costlier um, line than had been anticipated, and Matthew will be opening the front uh, fence still to enable greater access and circulation and providing a ramp entry at that location, um, although he cannot do everything he had hoped to originally with the path and the, the settings around the grass and the chairs. Um, and we look forward to sharing his installation schedule with you at the September meeting. And just very briefly, Paintbox and other short-term projects. Um, after the approval of the single artist public art guidelines during COVID-19, or as part of COVID-19, Response, the paint box artist resumed completion of utility boxes from the 2019 grant. We had awarded 35 grants in 2019. In 2020, paint box program will see 26 new or replacement designs, and the 2020 grant recipients will begin painting this month. All new locations for paint boxes have been added to the public art website, and the 2020 designs have been shared with the commission in advance of this meeting. Artists for He Many have chosen 10 teen artists to be part of a mural project. The mural project will be led by the AFH painting studio mentor artist, Jamil Radcliffe. Um, the location is, that they are proposing is the wall on the Congress Street side of Boston City Hall. City Hall. And here's an image of what they're proposing. This is a mural will be on vinyl and it will be installed uh, for one year as proposed. Um, it's entitled Facing the Future, and it will depict 20 diverse faces, each with a different mask, um, in one horizontal grid measuring approximately 100 by 5 feet, uh, with the 21st box containing the artist and AFH logo located to the far right of the mural. The mural will remain on the facade for roughly one year, with a proposed installation date of August 17th. And then uh, earlier this year, we provided transformative public art grants to a wide variety of projects, and we wanted to share an update with you. Um, and we're very happy to share that Victor Marker 27 Quinones recently completed his mural, Back to Essence, at 95 Magazine Street. This artwork was commissioned through the 2019 transformative public art grants, but installation was postponed due to delays in locating a site, the harsh winter, um, or an early winter we had that year, and later, um, because of COVID-19, but you can see uh, Marka in the upper left corner there uh, with his mask on, and um, you can see his, his beautiful work up uh, in Newmarket. And we're also happy to share that Rob Pro Black Gibbs also recently completed his mural, which we had originally uh, commissioned at the same time as Victor's Read Life 2 at Madison Park High in uh, Roxbury. This artwork was commissioned through 2019 also uh, and had the same delays and you can see Rob at work there and this project uh, became a partnership with the Museum of Fine Arts and has um, become part of a, a bigger project that they're running and it's part of his residency with them. Okay. Moving on. And just administrative, we just want to note again that we have not yet had the, um, the new commissioners have not yet been approved by the city council, but we continue to reach out to them and we hope to be able to welcome them to the commission soon and we thank them for their patience with us. And with that, I will turn it over to Mark and Aqua. Thank you.
Thank you, Karen. Um, there's a lot going on. That's great to see. Uh, we will now move on to the items on the agenda for review, public testimony, and commission vote. Uh, you will notice at the bottom of the screen that there are instructions for public testimony, which Karen Goodfellow will briefly go over now. Great. So I'll just go over on um, the ways to comment. And so if any of you have not used Zoom before, um, there are a few different ways you can communicate with us. You can raise your hand, uh, which you can do um, through the Zoom platform, um, or you can type your question to the chat box via the Zoom meeting platform. And by phone, if you're calling in, you can press star nine to raise your hand. And by raising your hand, we're just saying, let us know you wanna talk and we'll notice that we'll put you in a digital line. We'll type your name in. And when it's your turn, they will, will announce your name and ask you, um, ask you to speak, we'll unmute you, or you should be able to unmute yourself. You'll state your name and then you can share your comment or question. And we do ask that um, you keep your comments brief. Um, and whenever we're doing this, we'll, we will give a little time to let you um, gather yourself and, and enter your desire to speak. Next slide. Here you can see uh, exactly what I was talking about in terms of raising your hand. It should look something like this, that you would click on the participants button at the bottom of your screen, and then you would see that blue hand and you can press on that. And again, if that's uh, confusing to you, you can also just chat to us and say, you know, I'd like to make a comment. Thank you again, Karen. Uh, we will now have our first presentation for review, public testimony, and commission vote. Um, this is the East Boston Police Station Public Art Artist Selection Process. Sarah Rodrigo will be presenting the Artist Selection Committee's recommendation to us. Thank you, commissioners. Um, hi, everybody. The capital project associated with this commission is the new police station in East Boston, located on East Eagle Street. The call to artists, which was issued last year, identified several sites, both interior and exterior. The total budget is $450,000 to be awarded to one artist or artist team, and inclusive of all costs associated with the design, fabrication, and installation of the artwork. As many of you may know, East Boston is, like many other Boston neighborhoods, unique in its history and culture, and the artwork for this station should reflect that. The call identified three themes for this project, immigration, climate change, and community. We received 76 submissions to this call from artists and artist teams. Um, we had a wonderful artist selection committee, which included uh, Commissioner Alvarez, thank you, Commissioner Elliot Ortega, Kanan Thiruvengadam, uh, who is a resident of East Boston, Jesus Garcia Moda with the Office of Neighborhood Services, Lena Tremelli also with the Office of Neighborhood Services, Robert Anthony from the Boston Police Department, and Josiah Stevenson, principal with Lear's Weinzepfel Art Associates Architects. Also attending the meetings in an advisory capacity were colleagues Evan Brinkman, Brian Malia, and Susan Rice from Public Facilities, and Karen Goodfellow, Director of Public Art. So the selection committee independently reviewed the 76 submissions and through those reviews, we create a short list of 20 artists. The selection committee then virtually met and had a group review. They discussed the short list artist submissions using the BAC's curatorial vision and other criteria outlined in the call and ultimately selected three artists for interviews. I'll briefly review all three of those artists now and then let you know what the committee's recommendation is. The first artist interviewed was Neon, a collective group from the UK comprised of an architect, an artist, and a studio manager. Their work is site specific and they use a range of materials and approaches. I am running my own slideshow and I forgot, thank you. <laughs> they use a range of materials and approaches dependent on the site, end users, and length of installation. You can see a small sample of their works here. Their entire portfolio, as with the other two finalists, are in your folders along with their CDs. Most of their artwork is interactive, such as the chimes piece in the upper right, but without using motors or other technology. The next artist is Madeline Wiener. Her studio is in Colorado. She is a stone carver who creates functional sculptures in sites across the US, as well as stone reliefs, which you can see in the upper right hand two images. 
Uh, she works closely with the community at the site in her case to determine both stone choices and features of the figures. And lastly, we interviewed Monica Bravo, a self-taught video mosaic and glass artist originally from Bogota, Colombia, lately of New York City and now working in Miami. She creates colorful abstract artworks with embedded layers of imagery, working closely with the community and fabricators to capture what is special and unique about the culture at the site. She views her work as a form of service in the community where the work will be located. As you can imagine, this was a difficult decision for the committee. Um, each artist and team offered very different approach to the project. Ultimately, the committee agreed to recommend Monica Bravo for this commission based on both her philosophy of public artwork and her incredible colors and textures and content. And I'd like to ask at this point if uh, Commissioner Alvarez or Commissioner Elliot Ortega would like to make any commentary um, about the selection or if you'd rather hold comments. So that's essentially, that's it. So I think we're asking. Thank you, Sarah. Um, welcome. I can open it up to uh, questions or comments from the commissioners. Hey, quite, it sounds like you. I, was a, I had to get my mute button. Uh, this artist, Monica Bravo, does she have a, a sort of determined uh, process for connecting with the community? Will there be a series of workshops or will she just be collecting whatever people want to send her? What is her process on that? Yeah, I think all of them actually had a pretty intensive community uh, engagement process mm -hmm. in order to create the artworks. And I think that's why it made it most difficult. And I think, I mean, I especially leaned on the advice and opinion of uh, Kanan, who is, uh, you know, he's in the community. He runs a nonprofit in Eastie and he knows the community best. So, I mean, I think that's, that's how I leaned more. Um, the way I separated my, in my thoughts, if you think about, you know, Monica's work is abstract and colorful. Mm -hmm. and kind of philosophical and spiritual, whereas um, uh, Neon's work is very technical and concept-based. And then Meredith? No. Uh, Madeline. Madeline. Her work is, is purely figurative. Mm -hmm. And they all kind of come at art in different ways. But Monica knows Spanish. She's an immigrant herself. And considering how Eastie is an immigrant community itself, the Neon group is based in the UK. And then Madeline is based in Colorado. So, you know, just listening to Kanan, listening to the community stakeholders, you know, I think she, that's why she came up first. Thank you. It's some pretty compelling work too. Very beautiful. Yeah. I'm excited to see this happen. Could someone show us where in the uh, building the artwork is uh, proposed to be placed? So Just we, had, if you see on this slide, we yeah. identified numerous sites, both interior and exterior, but Monica's focus will most likely be on that interior space. If you see in the center, the lower image in the center, um, B is the community room that we understand will be very heavily used. Um, in this particular neighborhood. And that's, that and A, A and B are the primary focus for her work. Okay, that's helpful. It's gonna be a glass mosaic, I believe potentially produced in Germany. And I think, I think Karen mentioned that it will probably be the most colorful piece in the collection. Yeah, we're yeah, excited to have someone with color. Go ahead, Karen. Um, I was just going to add that, um, yes, I'm also excited about there being something with some color and some kind of life that way. Um, and also just the idea of like uh, illuminating in a really vibrant way this part of, a, of the building that is open to the public and the community room that is going to be really heavily used. Um, and so think like finding that as a nice um, synergy as well with, with this kind of work and where it's going to be positioned out of all of these sites. I think I would agree. I think the medium that she works in, I think it's a good choice and I can um, sort of visualize that um, being placed where B is. So I think 
I think that's an excellent choice you all made. <clears throat> I have a question. And first of all, I agree with the, the choice of the artist. I think she's wonderful. Um, but just to clarify, in that middle image um, of the police of the police station, would she get A or B or A and B wall? She could have both. She could have both. We did not limit the sites. Um, she was discussing. Part of our process is that we asked for that narrative proposal. Mm -hmm. So the her proposal may develop over the preliminary design phase. But she did also discuss um, the potential for a suspended piece in the interior, uh, which would be a little bit of a, a new format for her. But she's done quite a bit of, of divergent work over the years. So, but we're not limiting her to one or the other. And it's, it's a good budget, I think. Yeah, and we'll expect her to continue working with um, you know, people at the police station and community members. It's interesting because the work she showed on the subway, it's sort of a work that you confront over time. Uh, and so it might be interesting to use more than one space and to see the work as it unfolds over, you know, the two most heavily trafficked spaces of the building. That second space might be visible from the front as well, from outside. So that, that could also be a nice feature. Yeah, that's right. And um, I think, Sarah, correct me if I'm wrong, that at night, um, the architect was saying that you're going to really be able to see through that, um, that wall on the right side of A, and you'll be able to see into the space. Mm -hmm. So anything yes. that's in there that's illuminated is going to be really visible all the way down the street that kind of ends in this building. So it should be pretty striking. This image isn't isn't super helpful, unfortunately. But this the viewpoint that Car that Commissioner Elliot Ortega just mentioned will be from the American Legion playground direct direction, looking towards the site. So there's some very nice sight lines um, as people approach the building to to enter the community room or just passing by. Great. So Sarah, next, um, do we have any community partners to uh, hear from, or should we move on to see if there's any public comments? I am running through the, we have quite a, a large audience today. If there are members of the public who would like to uh, make a comment, we'd welcome uh, a few minutes of comments from the public. And then we'll, uh, just to be clear, we'll have a vote after that um, to, uh, uh, on the recommendations of the, of the committee. Any Oops. comments? It looks like there's a hand raised, Corey Pup. Yes, I see one hand raised. Corey, if you want to unmute yourself and speak, feel free to do so. Hi, um, sorry, I'm trying to unmute my hand. I have a comment for later, so I'm gonna oh. lower my hand. Sorry about that. It's okay. Thank you, Corey. All right, if there are no other comments from the public, then I think we can move to a motion. Uh, do I hear a motion? I would make a motion to accept the recommendation of the panel and um, of this artist. I would second that. Okay, great. Uh, so I will roll call through. Uh, Aqua Holmes? Yes. Camilo? Yes. Michael? Yes. Cara? Yes. George? Yes. Bob? Bob, you're muted, I think. I am, yes. Okay, and I am also a yes. So the motion passes. Uh, congratulations to the artist. Um, and given that there were some great runners up as well, uh, I hope we can continue to encourage them to apply for other works in the future. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next, we move on to our second presentation, Seawall, presented by Matthew Pollack. Uh, Matthew, if you could please unmute yourself and state your name, uh, and then you can begin your presentation. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Matthew Pollack. Um, I, I'm, my background is that I'm, I'm with Harbor Arts. We've been uh, uh, putting public art in East Boston, uh, in the East Boston shipyard for the last 10 years. Um, 
And uh, recently, uh, we invited Pangea Seed Foundation to bring their project, Seawalls Artists for Oceans, to Boston um, because it felt uh, so relevant to our community. Um, so uh, I'm here today, and thank you for having me uh, to share um, the work uh, that we are bringing to the East Boston Greenway. We've partnered with the East Boston uh, Greenway on two of our locations this year. Uh, the project was uh, heavily adapted uh, since you know the impacts of COVID-19 um, and and scaled quite a bit down uh, over the last several months from being a 15, 15 uh, mural project uh, to being a five mural project uh, with all local artists, two of which are located in the ship, uh, sorry, two of which are located on the Mary Ellen Welsh Greenway in East Boston, uh, and the others are located on Massport property along the Harbor Walk. Um, so, uh, I'm here to present the two murals uh, that we are painting with the East uh, Mary Ellen Welsh Greenway. Uh, just recently changed from the East Boston Greenway to the Mary Ellen Welsh Greenway. So if you hear me say East Boston Greenway, please uh, forgive me. It's taking some time to get used to the new the new title. Um, but uh, I think we also have um, Maria joining us from the from the Greenway, who will uh, she's here to answer any questions as well. Um, can we go to the next slide? So just uh, maybe a little too much text for this, uh, for this application here, but uh, background is uh, Seawalls is an international uh, initiative to uh, give the oceans a creative voice and paint for a purpose. Um, we've painted over 400 murals all around the globe uh, in many different countries um, through the project to engage communities and empower them to become uh, better stewards of our oceans and understand the importance of our oceans in in all of our lives. Um, and as East Boston and and Boston and our whole region is a coastal uh, community, uh, we we felt that um, as we saw this project uh, that it would be such a great application for our neighborhood. So we reached out um, in the spring of last year to invite them to to work with us. Uh, and and bring this work to bring this project to East Boston uh, with a local effort. Next slide. Um, so Pangea Seed Foundation uh, is uh, is is a nonprofit. It's actually based in Hawaii. They're they're our, our major partner on this um, on this. They they created a, a template project that is the global effort of of Seawalls Artists for Oceans. So. Um, our project is Seawalls Boston. It's a local uh, effort of, of their larger organization. And, and you know, uh, the Pangea Seed Foundation mission is through science, education, and artivism, they're empowering individuals and communities. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Um, uh, with, in the East Boston community, you know, we know that it's, it's, a, it's a very, uh, in, you know, as it is with any community, it's important to, to bring the community in. And we decided uh, last fall to uh, create a think tank. So we, we brought together um, thinkers and artists and community leaders uh, to a meeting and discuss what seawalls would look like in East Boston. Um, and from that, we developed uh, our team as well. So uh, next slide. Here are some past examples of work. Um, created by Seawalls Artists for Oceans around the world. Um, Seawalls, you know, a big part of the mission is that they, they paint with, you know, professional muralists that are, that are full-time muralists and it's, it's, the, it's the main, uh, you know, uh, focus of their work. Um, you know, it's, a, it's, it's a very important to, you know, ensure the, the community is going to receive, you know, artworks that they can feel proud and pride and ownership for, um, so we work with local uh, local artists this year, but you know, as far as the international project, uh, it's typically a mix of local, regional, and international artists that all work together, create an artist exchange from uh, other communities around the world that represent the the uh, diversity of that community. Um, next slide. Uh, the 2020 artist for the East Boston Greenway, the Mary Ellen Welch Greenway. 
uh, are Josie Morway uh, and Artists for Humanity. Both are Boston-based artists. I know where the latter we're uh, quite familiar with, and they were also uh, on on this call for another uh, proposal. Uh, so we have two locations on the Greenway that um, each artist will have uh, one wall, uh, which is uh, an uh, underpass of the street above. And uh, we can go to the next slide. So the two underpasses that we'll be uh, looking at this year are the Sumner Street uh, bridge underpass uh, and that wall will be uh, for Josie Morway and the Porter Street underpass for Artists for Humanity. Both walls have um, existing murals that have been there for a very long time. One, uh, the, the Zumix mural that you see on the right uh, at Porter Street uh, has been there I believe since pre-2000 and the Sumner Street mural uh, was created um, by a, a New England based artist in 2008. Um, we can take a look at the next slide which I believe uh, shows the condition of the existing mural at Sumner Street. So you see there's a lot of water damage, uh, graffiti, um, uh, the, the, the painting itself is damaged as well as the the plywood boards that they are on at this point have deteriorated quite quite a bit and we're working with you know the the greenway has determined that it's time for to renew the artwork at at, at these locations um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about the process um, and I think the next slide addresses that a little bit more oh this is the sorry we'll we'll skip ahead but we'll come back to the the removal process and the community um, but actually if we could go back a little or yeah actually sorry why don't uh why don't we go back a couple my apologies the flow was a little bit different than what i expected um so the proposed art artwork from josie morway her 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 body of work is often depicts uh birds and it's a uh, almost photorealistic with over like an abstract background um She's depicting the salt marsh sparrow, which is a native species to East Boston in the Belle Isle Marsh, which uh, is an area of East Boston that the Greenway uh, leads to. Um, and it currently goes almost all the way to the Belle Isle Marsh and it, there's talk of extension. Um, these birds are endangered uh, and at risk of losing their habitat due to sea level rise. Um, and what, what we're looking at now is a sketch. Uh, it's preliminary and this, uh, you know, there will be a bit of detail and uh, uh, added to this as well as, um, you know, trying to bring out and emphasize the sea level rise uh, aspect of, of the issue at hand. Um, we can go to the next slide. Here are some examples of Josie's recent work. Um, as you can see, uh, a little bit more focused in on the attention to detail um, and the abstract environment that she paints the birds in. Um, next slide. Um, so this is the wall of uh, Zumix. Um, this, this wall, the, sorry, this is the Zumix mural at uh, the Porter Street Bridge underpass. Um, this mural has been up for, I, we believe over 20 years. I, I couldn't find a date, um, but we're working with the Greenway um, and, and Zumix to, you know, Zumix and Artists for Humanity and, and the artists that will paint this uh, with Artists for Humanity, some of whom are East Boston youth, um, they do not have proposed artwork yet as uh, they're, you know, they're still in the creative process. Um, we will be asking to be placed on the September agenda to approve the final artwork. We're, but we are bringing in uh, this mural to this agenda because we are requesting um, to prep the walls in August. Uh, so that they may paint the walls uh, simultaneously with the other murals being painted as part of this uh, event. Um, you know, this event which is happening with with taking uh, safe distancing and uh, and and uh, you know restrictions in mind. Um, but we would like to paint, have the artists for humanity uh, be able to paint uh, along with the other artists because it's you know we have a lot of programming that will happen together. So 
um, it would be best if we can prep their wall this month uh, with you know asking for an exception to prep their wall prior to the approval of artwork um, which we will uh, put hopefully put have put on the September agenda um, the uh, the next slide um, going back to the uh, train mural this is uh, discussing the removal of the existing mural both murals will be documented, um, but this mural in particular, as it's a little bit more intact, um, we've discussed with the Greenway, the, the friends of the East Boston Greenway, their wishes to, and the community's wishes to uh, document um, uh, the mural to preserve its memory. And uh, prior to removing the mural, we will be uh, providing photographers, uh, Harbor Arts is uh, supporting the process of alerting the artists and the public by providing um, an expert photographer to uh, document the mural. Um, and we will also be offering uh, some graphic design services to um, you know, have a, a version of the documented mural that we can take out some of the graffiti and damage so that as much of the original mural um, can be viewed. Um, so we'll, we'll provide both, uh, you know, on, on, unchanged photographs as well as manipulated photographs that will try to uh, depict the mural as it would have originally uh, looked. Um, but we will be removing these murals. All of the screws are basically rusted out. We'll be drilling the, the screws out. Um, hey Matt, can we ask you to wrap up? Sorry, yeah, okay. If we can go to the next slide. Um, so public awareness, uh, we're working with the Greenway. The Greenway will be notifying the public uh, via email, uh, words and uh, through social media to and as well as signage at, on the site to um, uh, let the community know and let the artists and the artist is is uh, we're in contact with the artists to uh, have everybody on board and approve that uh, these murals will come down and we'll be replacing them with relevant artists uh, relevant artwork for the community um, and I think there's one more slide but that's about it yeah Thank you. <laughs> Sorry for the... Uh... Okay, thank you, Matthew. Um, that's great. So I guess if there's any commissioner questions um, at this time. I don't have a question, really just a comment that I'm, I'm very happy that artists and humanities have, uh, have been uh, selected. And I look forward to seeing their, um, uh, their uh, prepared piece at the September meeting. Thank you. I just want to confirm, so Matthew, these will be painted directly onto the concrete? Or yes, the, yes, like uh, they will be painted the... directly onto the concrete. Um, and we'll be using an elastomeric, uh, you know, uh, masonry paint uh, as a primer that hopefully will allow the um, murals, you know, a little bit of more flex than uh, the primer that was used previously. And we'll also be using a uh, clear coat on top to protect the murals from uh, water damage. Well, what's, what's, is anything painted on the wall opposite of this? Um, uh, there's murals on every wall on the Greenway. Uh, there's, uh, the opposite of Josie Morway's mural uh, is um, the uh, Heidi Short, uh, the grandmother mural, the Abuelas mural. Um, and opposite from the Artist for Humanity mural is uh, a, Another another uh, mural that depicts uh, the sailing history of East Boston and the Donald McKay clipper ship. Okay, thank you. Will there be any texts uh, providing the viewer information on the murals? Yes, uh, there will be signage, uh, permanent signage at the site um, that you know shares uh, information, the artist statement information about the the issue the environmental issue that they're painting and how that's relevant to the community um as well as listing our partners in and uh in the greenway um the folks involved and just for commissioners keep in mind that we'll be seeing the final artwork itself at the next meeting um and uh having approval so i think you guys are just coming before us to see if it's okay to paint over the existing murals uh, and yeah. i think 
with this strategy that you've notified or you will be notifying the public and at the site have signage and that you've also engaged with the artists. So I think that's our ask for today, uh, correct? Yeah, um, exactly. We're, we're just hoping to, to uh, prep the walls for the murals. Um, so we can move to public comment. I'm not sure that there will be any, uh, but we will just pause for a moment. And then uh, perhaps the commissioner can think of a motion uh, if we don't hear any public comment on this. I'm not seeing any hands raised. Okay, so uh, commissioners, you, uh, could somebody uh, prepare a motion? Well, um, it sounds like we need a motion to accept the proposal uh, pending approval from the artist or sign off from the artist and yeah, I think that's it. So I'm, I'm putting and, that- and public no A process of public notification, I'll add that to your motion if you don't mind. Yes, please. And the signage. Okay, so. do I hear a second? A second. I'll second it. Uh, so Cara seconded, I think. And uh, all those in favor? Um, so uh, Bob? Yes. Michael? Yes. Camilo? Yes. Cara? Yes. Aqua? Yes. Uh, wait, who did I just miss? George. Oh, George. Yes. Uh, and I will be also a yes. So the motion passes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very uh, much. Thank you, Matthew. Okay, so next up we have air, sea, and land. Um, uh, we, we now have term renewal for air, sea, and land by artist uh, San Miguel Aguda. Uh, renewal of the project will be presented by Tricia Gilrain. Thank you, commissioners. Um, so this is a term renewal for the public art installation called Air, Sea, and Land by San Miguel Aguda. The sculpture, the sculptures, plural, um, seven of which are 12 feet tall, two of which are pictured on this slide, um, are located on the Seaport Boulevard Parade and Corridor between Sleeper Street and East Service Road. The work was commissioned in partnership with Just Kids and WS Development in 2018. WS Development is seeking approval for another two-year term. They have submitted a maintenance plan for consideration of the sculptural elements, lighting, and surrounding landscape, which has been shared in advance with the commissioners. The second term would end October 2022. No changes are being made to the sculptural elements, lighting scheme, or surrounding landscape during the next two-year term. So next slide, please. Okay. And I do want to say that Stacy Crawley, Director of Property Management for WS Development is present in the meeting. If there, if any question, specific questions should arise, just so you're aware. Okay, thank you for coming, Stacy. Um, I'm just curious, why are they a temporary for two years? Uh, I'm just curious why they're not a permanent or... That was the intention from the beginning that they, they developed um, the, the plinths along Seaport um, so that there could be rotating art in the future. Okay. Um, Aqua, actually, I was going to ask if you wouldn't mind taking over this vote because I have, uh, I didn't realize, but I have a uh, reason I should recuse myself. Okay, sure, Mark. Um, I'm, I'm just curious, uh, why are they ex uh, extending this piece? Is it because uh, it, it's well loved or is it because they're not ready to move on to another proposal? I think there's a representative from the group here. Stacy, um, if you're present in the meeting and you wish to unmute yourself and uh, answer the question. It looks like she's in the meeting, but um, is not responsive. Okay. Um, I'm unmuting her now. Sorry, can you hear me? Oh, there, there we go. 
Great. Sorry, this I'm on Stacey. the phone and on the computer, so I was trying to get it. Um, so this is Stacy Colley with WS Development, and I think the question was why we're seeking another two-year term. Yes. Uh, primary reason is it's because it's so well loved and it's really starting just to get um, more and more traction and interest and attention. So uh, it's really well loved by all the neighborhood and gets a lot of commentary and feedback to our social and just um, from our you know our neighborhood. So we'd like to continue with that for the next two years based on that input we've received. Yeah, those are beautiful pieces. Any other commissioners have questions or comments about air, sea, and land? I, I had a question as to whether the, um, uh, the sculptures uh, had any maintenance um, requirements um, in the last several years that they've been up. Yes, one of the sculpture pieces, uh, it's pretty much the only one that's had any issues is myth it's uh, being two. It's um, the largest and tallest one. And uh, it has arms that are ex extended and the arms have become pretty popular for the public to grab onto, to hoist themselves up onto the uh, granite blocks for pictures. Mm. So we have had to engage with the artist um, and some local art conservators to repair it. Um, you know, it was, it's something, it's the only piece that's given us any trouble. And I mean, I, we are pleased that it's not sort of malicious. It's really people just trying to become one with the art. So um, we put some signs up and we've tried to put some defensive landscape that prevents people from grabbing onto the arms. Um, and we did repair it and we have um, some follow up with the artist on the repair, but that's the only piece that's given us any, any trouble. Thank you. Any other thoughts before we open up for public commentary? Okay, so I'm, I'd like to invite the public to ask questions or make comments about air, sea, and land. Um, if you can raise your hand, uh, you'll be put in a queue. And uh, we're asking also if you could just limit your commentary to two minutes or less. And uh, if there aren't any questions or comments, then we're going to go to uh, a vote from the commissioners. So at this time, uh, I'd like to do a roll call, or, or I guess we need a motion, don't we? Uh, I'd make a motion that we approve the extension of the, uh, for two more years of the pieces in their location. I'll second that. Okay, awesome. Motion made and seconded. And now I'll do a roll call of the commissioners. If you can just say uh, yes or no. So George Fifield. Yes. Bob Freeman. Yes. Uh, Camilo Alvarez. Yes. Mike. Yes. Cara. Yes. Now does Mark get to vote? No, he's recusing Mark himself. Get to vote. Okay. And I'm a yes as well. So that motion will carry. And Stacy, um, we're looking forward to two more years of those beautiful pieces. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, thank you, everybody. Uh, next up, uh, the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture uh, presented a three-part panel series facilitated by Aaron Jenea, uh, an artist in residence for the city of Boston. Uh, during this virtual panel series, Indigenous leaders and artists spoke about their work in the public realm and addressed how symbols perpetuating colonial myths affect the lives of Indigenous peoples in the city and contribute to the public health emergency of racism. Uh, uh, the three uh, events in this series were held on uh, July 21st, July 28th, and August 4th. The events were live streamed to the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture Boston Facebook page. Uh, during this virtual panel series, uh, Indigenous leaders and allies spoke about their works in the public realm and addressed how symbols perpetuating colonial myths contribute to the public health emergency. Uh, here's a list of the panelists from the three-part series. Uh, we now will hear from Aaron uh, Jania. Uh, to learn more about the program and its theme. So, Erin. Hi, thank you very much for listening to, to me today. I just wanted to provide you with a report back on the panels. Um, and it began with, uh, with my artist residency. My city partner is the Department of Emergency Management. 
And over the past several months, I've been developing this framework for addressing emergency situations that have cultural roots. Uh, for example, emergencies that arise from climate change, institutional racism, economic inequality, um, and things like that. Sort of these bigger overarching um, emergencies in our, in our society. Um, and what I have found is that so many of these problems that we're facing stem from the cultural norms um, that we are collectively subscribing to. And yet we have few methods available to us to address them from, from this lens. Um, so within this framework, which I don't really wanna get into too much detail here, um, I've been considering the role of the cultural sector. The Black Lives Matter movement um, has given us this opening to discuss and solve the issue of deep-seated institutional racism. Uh, in addition to the mayor's declaration that racism is a public health emergency, um, these things have created an imperative for our city to end racism. So in light of these developments and you know, in, within our roles as cultural workers, I just wanted to share this, the work that I've been doing around these issues to, to you, the Boston Art Commission. Um, over the past weeks, as you said, I've been organizing this three-part virtual panel series called Confronting Colonial Myths in Boston's Public Space. I wanted to show the diversity of perspectives from leaders and artists in the Native American and Indigenous communities, as well as allies um, that are united in this understanding that public expressions of white supremacy, um, in addition to Western cultural supremacy and colonization, continue to inflict harm on our communities, uh, from everyone from young children to teens to adults. Uh, Native American and indigenous people of this land um, are often not guiding these discussions, and yet they should be. So over the course of this time, we heard from a total of 11 people whose contributions on these issues raise, uh, raise, uh, ranged from health and wellness of people, um, to education, to art and public art, to tribal self-determination, to the invisibility of tribal people, particularly from the land that Boston is settled upon, to climate change, and so, so much more. Uh, and these speakers express the multitude of ways that colonial myths in public space reach into other areas of life across time and space and culture. And I just wanna make sure that, um, that I let you know who they are because they're um, people who are working very hard on these issues um, in our community, in our city. Elizabeth Solomon, who is a Massachusetts uh, member, tribal member at Ponkapog. She's the Director of Administration in the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences as, at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Jenny Oliver, who is also of the Massachusetts Tribe at Ponkapog um, and founder of Modern Connections Dance Collective. Kristen Wyman, who is Nipmuc and co-founder of Eastern Woodlands Rematriation. Mahtoui Monroe, who is Lakota, and co-leader of the United American Indians of New England and lead organizer for Indigenous Peoples Day, MA.org. Jean-Luc Perit, um, who is of the Tunica Biloxi tribe and president of the North American Indian Center of Boston. Lily Many Colors, who I believe you, you've talked to her um, before, Choctaw artist and scholar who had her beautiful piece on the commons recently. Um, Darlene Flores, uh, the United Federation of Taino People and owner of Paraya Wellness Clinic. Heather Lavelle, who is the co-founder of Italian Americans for Indigenous Peoples Day. Pierre Belanger, uh, Gazal Jafari, and Pablo Escudero of Open Systems. So it was really an honor to be in conversation with, with these folks um, who are so dedicated and knowledgeable, and I, I owe them a debt of gratitude. I feel we all owe them a debt of gratitude for the works and the contributions that they're doing to raise awareness around these issues. So now that the panels are over, one of the things that I'm reflecting on and I kind of keep coming back to is the, the issue of violence. Um, aside from inflicting a kind of psychological violence upon us, in public spaces that carries through into our private spaces. I feel that these monuments promote an atmosphere of violence because they are upholding white supremacy. Um, through white supremacy, and in my view, Western cultural supremacy too, these monuments tell the world that it's okay to inflict genocide and slavery. It's okay to discriminate against indigenous people, black people, people of color, 
and to think of us as less than. I believe that this physical violence and the threat of physical violence are only one step removed from the things that glorify white supremacy and colonization, in particular, these monuments in our public spaces. They create a dangerous environment for people. We experience this in many ways, but in the panel we discussed the epidemic of missing and murdered indigenous women and femicide, high suicide rates amongst our people, racial profiling, and there's just so much more. Um, but this also includes things like death threats and threats of physical harm that people who stand against white supremacy receive for speaking and acting. Um, and those are, you know, continuing to happen. So there's a lot of material there that we covered. And if you haven't had a chance to watch them, I encourage you to look at them as you consider how to move forward with an overarching policy for those monuments and memorials and public art in the city's collection. Um, I feel that each monument really has its own special set of circumstances, its own history, and its own reasons for existing that all need to be addressed within this process. However, when it comes to the Christopher Columbus statue, I feel like this is a special case because it's a particularly strong flashpoint in our city as a symbol of Italian American pride. Um, I was lucky to participate in the emancipation group hearings um, that were brought about by the community organizing work of artist Tori Shiloh. Um, and I, I think the BAC should consider maybe a different approach that allows for marginalized voices to be heard um, through this process of thinking of what to do with the Christopher Columbus statue. Um, you know, if, if we're to have a statue up canonizing Christopher Columbus, and as we consider what the next moves for the statue will be, I feel it's important to understand exactly what he did um, and what it means for the ongoing oppression of indigenous people, black people, and people of color today. These are very painful issues, and I think it would be hard to capture in a two minute soundbite, um, you know, all of these issues that come up, you know, we're talking about genocide, and there's really been no truth and reconciliation to date about the founding of our country of America or of Boston. And so um, I guess I would like to just propose that the BAC include an agenda item uh, with sufficient time for local indigenous people to speak about these extremely traumatic issues without interruption and without the fear of being targets of hatred or violence or, uh, or genocide denial in the process. Um, so yeah, so I just wanna encourage you to think about how to reduce the possibility of more trauma or harm, you know, coming through this process as, as it is designed. So maybe a, a presentation of an hour or 90 minutes where people can, can talk about this uh, as one thing um, is just a suggestion. So I also wanna add that personally, it's really important to me to express that this isn't about discriminating against Italian Americans at all. Um, my beloved grandmother, who was my inspiration to be an artist, was Italian American. So I have this heritage in addition to my indigenous heritage of Dakota and Adua tribes. Um, you know, for me, it's about rooting out racism and exposing it to the light for the harm it does to the people in our community. So this is some, some of my final thoughts. I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, you know, as I, as I consider the next few months of my residency and I'm working on this cultural emergency response project, um, I'm continuing to ask some overarching questions to all people working in the cultural sector. How can our work build community strength through decolonization? How can we leverage the processes that we use to help people better understand our differences as well as our similarities? And how can we best act in support of one another in these extremely difficult times? So those are kind of what I'm continuing to think about and just wanted to put it out there for people, uh, for you in particular. Um, it's my view that the presence of these statues is one big impediment to this work. Um, increasing the opportunities for those people who have been marginalized for so many years, generations, lifetimes in our city is essential, as is amplifying their voices. And I urge you to find ways of doing this. Taking down these monuments and enacting a process of community healing is not easy but it's needed and it could make a real difference towards rejecting white supremacy and colonial mythology in our city's public spaces. Thank you.
Uh, thank you very much, Aaron. This is a impassioned topic and you bring an incredible voice to it. So we really appreciate you uh, working with us in air and also uh, in this regard. Um, and to your specific comments and suggestions, we will definitely listen to those um, as we uh, determine if uh, a vote happens today to set up a process that we would set up a, a hopefully thoughtful one that allows um, uh, everybody to speak their, their voice in the, in, the, in the right setting and also for uh, times that allow for a real communication. Um, so thank, thank you. you very much, Aaron. Uh, I am going to pause our agenda for just a minute. I think that um, uh, Karen, you said that there was somebody who had some technical issues. Yeah, Diane Monica said she wanted to make a comment about the East Boston Police uh, Station, but she wasn't able to, we weren't able to see her hand raised. Um, Diane, I don't know if you're still with us, if you're able to unmute yourself and, and share your testimony on the East Boston Police Station. Is she no longer with us? I don't know. I think she might be having technical difficulties. Okay. I'm sorry, Diane. Maybe there's another format where we could, uh, you could share with the commission uh, via email um, if this uh, format doesn't seem to be working. I'll let you know if she, uh, she sends me an email. I'll monitor for that. Or you could email to Karen and she could read your statement as part of the record. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, we will now have time for the public to offer testimony on the Christopher Columbus statue that was located in Christopher Columbus Park. Um, next slide, uh, Aqua, you have a statement to read. Okay, so um, just a little bit of background before we begin. The Christopher Columbus statue that's located in Christopher Columbus Park was originally installed in 1979. The sculpture is by an unknown artist and the pediment was made by Andrew J. Mazzola's Monument Works in Norwood, Mass. According to the records of the Boston Art Commission, it was never formally voted on in 1979, but because of its place on city property, it still falls under the BAC's purview. Sculpture was most recently vandalized on June 10th, 2020, when it lost its head, and the history of vandalism includes incidents in 2004, 2006, 2015, and 2018. Following the most recent case, the statue was removed from its pedestal and placed in storage. Uh, thank you. So next um, slide, please. Uh, members of the public will now have an opportunity to provide testimony regarding the Christopher Columbus statue. Uh, today's discussion, I, I just want to note, is to determine if sh we should move forward with a public review process for the sculpture to determine its future. Uh, such a process would involve future engagement in longer public hearings, uh, as well as the collection of public feedback via surveys and written testimony, as well as potentially other methods. We would direct staff to prepare archival work and a fuller assessment of the statue uh, prior to those sessions. Uh, and we would establish criteria by which a decision would be made. Uh, so to be clear, today's discussion is not to determine if the statue should be restored or not. Um, it is to determine if this statue warrants a full public process of review in the coming months, when the public would be invited to give uh, testimony again. Um, so with that, um, I will open it up uh, to a list. Uh, Aqua and I will uh, manage the list. Again, we're asking people uh, to keep in mind that this is not a, a uh, vote on removal or restoration. Uh, it is a vote as to whether we should have a public discussion about the statue um, uh, for consideration about its future and that we'd ask you to um, limit your comments to two minutes, your testimonies to two minutes. Um, so who is going to, Tricia, are you going to manage the list? So Sarah will be writing down all of the um, people who wish to give public testimony. And okay. I believe she will be sharing her screen momentarily. Okay. So let's give it a minute. If you've uh, raised your hand, uh, Sarah will be uh, putting your name on a list and then we'll call you in sequence on that list. Um, okay, great. Could you zoom in a little bit, Sarah? <laughs> a lot. And actually, Aqua, you want to start us off? Sure, I will. First, I want to thank everyone who's joining us today. Um, it's so great to have so many people here to discuss these things and give commentary on 
projects that are in the works and also the future of public art in our city. Uh, I'd like to invite Diane M Modica. Um, Trisha, can you make that just a little larger? It's a really tiny for me. I hope I said your name correctly. Diane Modica, you have the floor. I actually think Diane might be the person who was trying to get on earlier. Is that correct, Karen? Yeah, it is. It, it looks like she's still having technical difficulty. So, okay. Um, well, see. she can come back at a later time. Let's move on oh. to Daniel DeLuca. And Diane, when you um, when you're back, just let us know when you have um, connection. Is Daniel DeLuca with us? Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, Danielle. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so um, my name is Danielle DeLuca. I'm a former resident of Boston, and I currently work in the city. Um, I'm speaking here as a co-founder of Italian Americans for Indigenous People. Um, we are a group of Italian Americans who work to dismantle the honoring of Christopher Columbus in public spaces and as a public holiday in Massachusetts. Um, we feel that Columbus is not an appropriate symbol to honor Italian American heritage um, and have listened to the voices of our indigenous colleagues um, and friends and learned the complete history of Columbus, um, who we feel is a man responsible for the genocide of the people of the Caribbean and the, and the establishment of the transatlantic slave trade. Um, as a symbol of white supremacy, we feel that Columbus is a source of, um, we know that Columbus is a source of deep pain for indigenous people. So as a large and growing group of Italian Americans, we know there are many, many better ways to reflect on our heritage and we reject the centering of Italian experiences in these discussions. So for these reasons, we um, agree that a further public comment should um, continue, but that this space should be um, centering Indigenous voices on these issues. Um, so an, an in-depth public forum process where Indigenous peoples and allies can take that appropriate space to discuss and educate on their experiences on why Columbus needs to come down um, is appropriate. Um, and for the record, also, we believe that Columbus, the Columbus statue should be permanently removed. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Danielle. Um, Hello. Hello. Can anyone hear me? Are you Diane Modica? Can I am. <laughs> I've, been, I've been swimming upstream for about an hour now, but I'm uh, trying to get on. But anyway, thank you. All right. You are here. Okay, great. So uh, my name is Diane Modica, and I'm the chairperson of the Commission for Social Justice for the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts uh, Order of Sons and Daughters of Italy in America. Rather long title, but I think you sort of know it as the Sons and Daughters of Italy. Um, and, I, you know, our commission is... Um, is charged with, uh, you know, overseeing anti-defamation uh, of the Italian um, American, you know, uh, heritage. And uh, in that vein, um, you know, we get involved whenever it appears to be that there is some kind of um, bias or defamation, prejudice, bigotry that is underway. And that what brings us to this meeting. And uh, at the beginning, I thought, uh, although I did hear you while you said that there was no vote today, um, I assume that that's a decision that's already been made, although it was advertised as a vote. And what we were going to ask is that you vote to um, repair and restore the statue to its location um, at the uh, Waterfront Park. Um, seeing as you um, look like you're going to you know, pursue further engagement, I just want to address a few points because I think they'll come up. And by the way, I did submit a rather, uh, I think it was four page uh, statement to the commission relative to 10 reasons why we think, and that's a small amount of reasons why we think our request is actually compelling. But let me digress then, um, because I think I also submitted to you um, a 20 page a report by the National Sons of Italy, which is called Columbus Fact Versus Fiction, in which a lot of the um, myths, if you will, about Columbus are actually addressed. Some of them, you know, obviously uh, fictional as opposed to factual. And I think that's really, really important, even for those uh, people who are opposed to the Columbus statue to read, because I did hear the prior speaker, speaker as well as Aaron, you know, speak to um, Columbus himself and some of the uh, claims that are made against him. And so if we're going to have education on the other side, then I think there has to be really um, you know, extensive education on the Columbus side. I mean, there have been scholars uh, who have visited this subject, who have done intense research on primary source documents, on all sorts of issues that have come up around Columbus. And I have not heard one um, 
one one scintilla of any kind of exposition of that in any kind of public space, any public media, or even from you know some of the uh, organizations that are looking at this from the um, opposite view. So that being said, I just want to say that these false narratives really troubling to us because they've really dominated the political and the public discourse. And in doing so, they, you know, they've basically promoted this um, effort to, to tarnish, destroy, and undermine the reputation of Christopher, Christopher Columbus and basically dismiss any of the accomplishments, extraordinary accomplishments that this man um, achieved. And it also has distorted the public narrative um, insofar as many people are believing it without looking at anything from the other side. Right. Without going into his accomplishments, I think that, you know, you, you can read that. Diane, you're over your two minutes. I thank you so much for that. If you've sent that 20-page uh, paper into the office, perhaps we can share it. I'm not sure, but I think We you. have it. Okay. So I thank you for that. And we're going to move on to Corey Pop. Hi, and, uh, who am I talking to? Because I actually didn't, um, you know, I joined in on it and see who's, is this, is this uh, Vice Chairman Diane, Holmes? Yes. Diane, yes. Yes. All right. Well, so I really feel that we should have an opportunity to be heard somewhat more because there has oh. been no discussion, no public discussion on the Italian American position by our organization, which is the largest organization in Massachusetts. What we're trying so, to do, I mean, I hope this isn't the additional uh, public process will be. So stay tuned. Let's hear what other folks have to say, and then we'll decide um, what's going to happen next. It'll be exciting. Okay, Corey, let's go. Hi, thank you all for your time. I'll keep it super brief. Um, I also am a co-founder of Italian Americans for Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, I am also just chiming in to ask again that you do um, continue with the public hearings and in fact even allow um, hearings specifically for the Indigenous voices in our community who have not been able to be heard um, sometimes over the clamor of others. Um, and then I just have a very brief statement to read. Uh, we deeply regret that some Italian Americans find it morally acceptable to continue celebrating one of history's greatest villains, despite the knowledge that their actions are harming others. Many immigrant groups experience religious and ethnic discrimination while assimilating in this country. Italian Americans are not unique in this regard. Rather than using these experiences to justify their celebration of Columbus, we encourage our Italian American sisters and brothers to employ the platform our ancestors have given us to ensure that we are not repeating the same patterns of discrimination that they endured. Too often debates about Columbus are centered around the feelings and concerns of Italian Americans, but we hope that you will continue to focus this conversation on the indigenous people of our community, what they need and deserve, and what we all gain by refusing to celebrate Columbus. So please do continue um, with the public forums and and holding hearings, uh, particularly geared toward um, the voices of the indigenous community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Corey. <clears throat> I'm invite Gavin Villario to, um, to speak, and then Mark, if you want to jump in after that, that would be great. Gavin, are you with us? Gavin. Have we lost you? Uh, we could leave him on the list, but move to the next speaker. If he, uh, okay. if he gets his connection, we can come back to him. Sounds good. Um, so next speaker, uh, Jean-Luc Pierre. And make Hello, sure you- My name is uh, Jean-Luc Pierrit, uh, P-I-E-R-I-T-E. -E. I'm a resident of Jamaica Plain, and I serve as president of the board of directors at the North American Indian Center of Boston. Um, and uh, just uh, very quickly, I, uh, just to build off of the idea uh, from Erin Genia that we cannot capture uh, 500 years of, um, of violence against Black and Indigenous peoples, uh, we can, uh, at the very least, uh, discuss in full, uh, full detail the history around uh, the Columbus statue itself. Uh, I, I noted that uh, the, the person who actually commissioned uh, the statue, Arthur Stipoletto, was not uh, was not mentioned in the slide, um, and that site, uh, the pedestal of the uh, the Columbus statue, is where Mr. Stipoletto had previously burned flags of Iran and, and the Soviet Union, uh, and built off his legacy as a, a pro-Vietnam uh, war uh, protester. So. I say that because I, I would ask of this uh, of this commission to 
actually think about the utility of the statue, the messaging of the statue, the politics around the statue, not necessarily centuries, but we're talking about decades, and whether or not uh, that messaging has, uh, has run its course. Uh, I would further advocate uh, for uh, representatives of indigenous nations, uh, particularly the Massachusetts tribe at Ponkapog and the United Confederation of Taino Peoples, uh, be in, uh, integrated into the review and study process uh, so that uh, the voices of indigenous nations aren't just heard, uh, but they are at the table when it comes to consideration of, uh, of the public good, especially when we are recognizing this as the traditional indigenous territory of the Massachusetts nation. So I thank you for uh, the time and uh, thank you. Jean-Luc, can you just um, give the name of the person that commissioned the statue again? I wanted to write that down. It is uh, Arthur Stivaletta, S-T-I-V-A-L-E-T-T-A. Uh, he was more commonly known by his nickname, Mr. Wake Up America. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for your comments and for your uh, uh, thoughts on the process as well. Uh, so our next speaker is Patrick Mason. Patrick, are you? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, board. I appreciate this time. Um, my name is Patrick Mason. I'm actually a member of the Osage Nation. I'm also uh, an attorney, one of the preeminent attorneys on Indian law and tribal court systems. Uh, I'm, in, I'm out in New Mexico, but I'm also on the board of directors for the Knights of Columbus, along with another one of my Native American brothers. And you know, this park that you're talking about was paid for by the Knights of Columbus um, originally. And Columbus is our namesake, and we don't think that he is a um, you know, a perfect man by far, um, but he is our namesake and he was chosen as the namesake of the Knights of Columbus because at the time when the Knights were founded, he, uh, Catholics and immigrants in America were not welcome and they were persecuted. And this was a hero that many Americans looked for as one of the founders of this, this, uh, this, new, this, new, this new mission. And so that's why he was chosen to educate the public, to form the public, that we, we as Catholics were also part of this country and should not be persecuted against. Most importantly though, as a Native American um, who deals with these issues on a daily basis on the Navajo Reservation and throughout the country from each, each coast, this seems to me like a red herring and, and the Columbus issue, I'm kind of the opposite of, um, of the Italians that were advocating for Indigenous Day. I'm a Native American advocating to stop going after Columbus because it's like, it, what, what you do is when you use him as a scapegoat, as you use him as a whipping boy, you forget about all of the atrocities that were not committed by Columbus. Columbus, as we all know, never set foot in Massachusetts, in Connecticut, where the first reservations were established. There's numerous people, historical figures in Massachusetts, Connecticut, New England, that committed horrible atrocities against the native peoples. The Spanish in the Southwest did nothing by comparison. We still have our native tribes in the Southwest. In New England, they were all but wiped out. And so to blame Columbus for that atrocity is one of the most disgusting things I could think of as a Native American whose grandfather still lives in Oklahoma on the traditional lands of my family. I, when I see everything being laid to the feet of Columbus, I'm like, why are we even talking about Columbus who has nothing to do with this? What we need to do, and I completely advocate, the indigenous people need a voice, the voice that has not been heard. We are persecuted to this day. I live on the reservation. I see the persecution every single day of my people. And yet we're talking about Columbus? Why? We need to be talking about the issues affecting indigenous people, indigenous women, native women that are disappearing every day. These are the issues we need to be talking about. And the more we talk about Columbus, the more it gets away from the actual issues affecting our people. So I would, I would, kindly and very sincerely ask this commission to vote no, that don't go for any further on this. Let the park be restored or whatever else, but we don't need a discussion around Columbus. And maybe an alternative would be for the commission to propose an indigenous and native art project that, that you could propose to, to have these native voices heard, but not, I don't care about Columbus. I don't want to have anything to do with Columbus. You're actually at time now. Can I vote? Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for, thank you for your thoughts. Yes. Uh, 
Next up, uh, we have Gen Jennifer Braceres. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Hi, yes, my name is Jennifer Braceres. I am a lawyer, political columnist, and a former member of the United States Commission on Civil Rights. Um, I'm here today as a proud member of the Puerto Rican community, Italians, but also to Hispanic Americans who understand that Latinos as a people quite literally would not exist, but for Columbus and the Spanish colonization that followed. In fact, the holiday that Americans call Columbus Day is proudly known throughout the Latin American world as Dia de la Raza, Day of the Race, our race, a race that includes elements of three cultures, Spanish, African, and indigenous, all of which we celebrate. Latinos and Italians have long worked together to celebrate Columbus as a symbol for Catholics and immigrants in America. In 1907, Colorado became the first state to observe Columbus Day as an official holiday after an Italian immigrant by the name of Dan Den Vierte, Angelo and its Senator Casimiro Barea to sponsor a bill proclaiming October 12th a day to honor Columbus. Not surprisingly, and I think very importantly um, for today's discussion, in the 1920s, the Ku Klux Klan began to demonize Columbus as a way to trash not only Italians, but Hispanics and other Catholic immigrants to America. Those who denigrate Columbus today in the name of tolerance feed into the KKK's bigoted narrative while doing nothing to address actual racial injustice. I implore you, don't take the bait. By all means, let us honor the indigenous people who lived here long before European explorers arrived. Let us honor them with their own statues, parks, and holidays, and artwork. But please, do not eliminate ours. Do not eliminate this important symbol of Italian American heritage, of Latino heritage, and indeed of all Im immigrants to our nation's shores. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Um, Equa, you want to take the next? Sure. I, I'm going to invite Denise Fanari to speak. Denise, please. Yes. Hi. Um, I'm Denise Fanari, and I currently hold the position of State President of the Order of Sons and Daughters of Italy in America, Grand Lodge, Massachusetts. I came on because I didn't think my, my member, Diane Modiker, would get on, so I was going to read some of her testimony, but I do want to reaffirm her, our position here as far as stating that Christopher Columbus is a symbol of our Italian heritage. And for centuries, Christopher Columbus has been the symbol through which we Ital Italian Americans have celebrated our ethnicity. In fact, it is so symbolic that the United States government chose Columbus Day of 1942 to remove the label of enemy aliens that was applied to Italian Americans during World War II. Defacing, defaming, and removing these symbols that we feel so passionately about denigrates and disrespects our hard-won recognition and the contributions that we have made to the city of Boston, the Commonwealth, and to this nation. I realize that this is only a process right now uh, we were hoping that we could get this restored, but removing the Statue of Columbus does nothing to help resolve the tensions and difficulties faced by a modern society trying to interpret the past. What it does is delegitimize the city's Italian Americans' history, stories, and struggles. And we have just as much as a right to have those represented as any other group. We work hard every day, just like our forefathers did, to make this city a better place for all of us. And I just want to make it perfectly clear that we do not want to not have an Indigenous Day. We would like to see Indigenous Day be celebrated, but we do not want that replaced, our holiday, the Christopher Columbus Day holiday. So we strongly recommend that through this process that we can have this statue restored and put back in its rightful place at Columbus Park. 
thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Denise. Thank you for your comments. I want to try to reach out to Gavin Villario again to see if uh, he's on the line. Gavin, are you there? Okay, then. Um, let's move on to Michael Sullivan. Michael? Hi there. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I'll try to be brief. Um, I'm here pretty much as myself. Um, I am very interested in the Boston Art Commission and the work it's been doing. I uh, primarily logged in today to see what was going on with the Lincoln statue in Park Plaza. So I did uh, see some of that and that was very interesting. Um, I do personally think that more discussion is probably a good idea. Um, regardless of at what, at what point, regardless of when the Boston Art Commission decides to vote on to remove or to restore the Christopher Columbus statue, uh, I would be a voice in favor of uh, more public discussion. And I do have a question which you may not be able to answer or perhaps you would answer at a future meeting, but should any statue be removed uh, or, or moved, I suppose would be another way to put it, uh, what happens to those statues? I'm assuming the Christopher Columbus statue is owned by the city of Boston. If not, please correct me, uh, assuming that it is, or if another statue is owned by the city of Boston and it is then deemed or decided to remove it, where does it go? What happens to it? Thank you very much. Michael, those are really good questions and I'm sure there are multiple answers depending on the situation, but thank you for um, putting that forward. I'm gonna move to uh, Nadia DiCarlo. Nadia, can you step to the mic? Yes, can you all hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Good afternoon. I come before the commission as a first generation Italian American who is involved and elected to a number of Italian organizations here in the Commonwealth, one of which is also an arts patronage and restoration group. These organizations represent both the old and the new wave of immigrants from the ones that came and helped and build the city and the Commonwealth to now where many are at the helm of our leading institutions headquartered here. Christopher Columbus was the first immigrant to the Americas and as such represents all immigrants. Not honor or recognize him goes against the immigrant experience. Not all historical figures were perfect, but we're not celebrating the individual or his birthday. We're celebrating the whole idea of cultures colliding for better or for worse and the new people coming to these shores. We stand for diversity and inclusion, but not at the cost of devaluing or defaming the immigrant experience that richly and prolifically make up the Commonwealth, whether they are Italian, the Hispanic and Latino community, the indigenous community, and the many others who continue uh, to do great things for the Commonwealth and the ones that continue to come here. I respectfully ask the commission to proceed directly to restore the defaced Columbus statue and place it back in its home where the Mass State Council originally placed it to honor the patron of immigrants. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. Um, I, I, I just wanna say that we're very close to six o'clock and we have uh, 11 people on our list. So I believe we're going to stop for today. And um, after we take a vote on continuing this process, whether or not to continue. Well, I was gonna propose that we could maybe extend for another uh, 10 minutes. I think we will be extended for 10 Oh, minutes. okay, yeah. We oh, you're saying we're closing the list. We right. may not even make the whole list. I'm a little worried about it, but we'll have plenty of chance for further commentary at another meeting. Absolutely. So Mark, why don't you go ahead and... Um... Okay, next up is Bernie Sapienza. Yes, hi. Uh, I'm new to this group. I just sort of saw the meeting and I thought I'd join because I'm a local resident and I'm an Italian-American. I live in the neighborhood. And um, I thought it was just kind of interesting to try to understand how this process was going to work. So the first thing before I make a comment, I, I wanted to ask a question. So this conversation is to determine whether or not there's more public comment. What happens if there's not more public comment? What, what is there a default? Um, there's no default yet, but um, there could be then another discussion about whether we restore it uh, directly. I see. So, so, so it could take many forms then. It could either be restored yeah. and replaced. It can be restored and put in a museum. It could be that it's never coming back. There's a it lot of possible outcomes. That could be the end result, you know, in a future meeting. And the decision lies with whom? 
How is that decision made as to whether it comes back, whether it gets restored, whether it doesn't come back? Uh, it lies with the Boston Art Commission, uh, and we always have a public process uh, to help guide us in that decision. I see. Okay, great. So, um, so I know you guys are short on time. So, uh, you know, Jennifer and Patrick and Diane and Denise and Nadia wrote down the names. Uh, I, I echo all the things that they said. Uh, Italian Americans, I think, are very proud of Christopher Columbus, but I think an awful lot of the neighborhood, and I think about how the park itself and Christopher Columbus within the park sort of anchors the neighborhood physically. And I, I conduct a lot of personal tours for friends and family around here. And the fact that it is the Italian North End and the fact that it is Christopher Columbus and Christopher Columbus Park has a lot to do with the tourism of the area, the same way that all diversity is celebrated by tourism. And I believe that it's a big deal if you look at all the tourists that are now missing from the city. And I, I live right at the corner of Fleet and Commercial Street where all the, uh, the hop on, hop off buses stop. And having seen this stream for 12 years of people just heading to the Paul Revere house and into the North End and the stream of people carrying Mike's pastries box, boxes back the other way, um, and now not seeing any of that. And you think about the way that the city presents itself, uh, not just within itself and the way that it celebrates its diversity and community, but you also think about how we present ourselves as a city to people coming to visit here from all kinds of other places. And so uh, from a tourism standpoint, it's very important that this neighborhood and that park maintain its traditional values. And, and I don't want to get into the whole conversation about the um, whether or not Christopher Columbus was a good guy, bad guy, I will leave this discussion by, by saying that there is a great definitive book on the topic for anyone who's listening who'd like to learn about what this was really like before Christopher Columbus got here. There is a definitive book called 1491, and it's written by Charles C. Mann. And that book, uh, 1491, as the title would indicate, is- uh, uh, over time. Um, Thank you. Yeah. You gave the thank name you. of the book, and thank you for your questions and for your comments. Um, Next is Madwin M. My name is Matoi Monroe, and I'm co-leader of United American Indians of New England, and I've also been the lead organizer for the statewide Indigenous Peoples Day campaigns since 2015. I'm not going to respond point by point to some of the things that people have said here. I did want to add, though, to Jean-Luc's comment about Arthur Stivaletta, that Arthur Stivaletta and some of the other people who pushed very hard for this statue and for this park to be named Christopher Columbus Park back in the 1970s were also leaders of war. That is the movement of white people to stop the desegregation of Boston public schools. So the roots of this park are embedded in some very racist people here in Boston. And I think that's important for the record to say that. Mm -hmm. You know, the parks should belong to everybody. That, the park over in the North End is not a park that just belongs to the North End. It's right there. It's visited by thousands of tourists from all over the world. Those of us who work in downtown offices visit, you know, are in that area all the time. It's a public area. And in 2020, there should be no room in Boston for white supremacist statues to be on display in a public park. It's just that simple. And we as indigenous people have been educating about that for years. I want to talk about the process, which is that we need, we need the BAC to give us some time and space to make proper presentations in full about the genocide that was begun by Christopher Columbus and why Indigenous people Mom, have been... I have to cut you off here just because we have so many people behind you. I'm sure I haven't spoken two minutes. Yeah, actually you have. And um, we also need to take a vote. We have to have time for that. But um, hopefully we will be looking at more conversations that will be more long, will be longer and more respectful of the subject. Okay, so I'm just going to move on to Jenny. Hi, my name is Jenny Oliver and I am a Massachusetts tribe member of Private Ponka Pong. Um, I was one of the panel members that um, Aaron had presented on earlier, and I really encourage everyone on the call to check out the panels, especially the second panel that talks a lot about this particular issue around Christopher Columbus and the statue and um, 
the how it was implemented and the history around it because I think that there's a lot of valuable information there. Speaking from my own perspective, I find that um, it's very difficult to be in a space where you this is your ancestral land and yet you are continuously uh, being erased. And uh, as I'm hearing from a lot of the counterparts on this call that, you know, people don't want to be erased. They don't want their heritage to be erased or their history to be erased. And I also stand, you know, for my heritage and my history and for my um, future children and the longevity of the descendants of the peoples whose ancestral lands this is, that we also have an opportunity to not be um, erased or suppressed or continuously um, silenced in the face of city and diversity. Um, I think that it's very harmful uh, psychologically, emotionally, through systems of racism and oppression. And I vote to, or I would like to advocate for more uh, open discussions for um, this topic. Thank you so much. Uh, we, I think we'll be able to take two more uh, folks. So 1781, 324, et cetera, et cetera. Are you still with us? And are you ready to comment? Okay. Should we move on to the next? Yes. User Lynn Courier. <laughs> Lynn Courier, I guess that is. Uh, we're going to try to make a hard stop. Yeah. 610 so that we can have time. Hi. Thank you, Lynn. Go for it. Hi. Um, hi. Hi. Um, I'm Penacook Abenaki woman. I'm a mom. Um, our family is very mixed, indigenous as well as black and European. So I come from a pretty broad perspective. And I just want to say as a rhetorical question that everyone needs to ask themselves, would we even be talking about a statue of Hitler? Would we even be talking about a statue of David Duke? Would we even be talking about a statue of Robert E. Lee? We need to be real about this and put it in perspective. As well, if, if the vote has been on the emancipation statue to keep it down, I would be very, very disappointed and concerned if, if this didn't turn out in the same way. When we look as indigenous people at a statue of Columbus, it's traumatizing to us. It's generational trauma. I, I was not in his plan being Pentecost Abenaki. Our family was not in the plan. We were virtually, we were not wiped out, but a lot of us moved up to Canada because of what happened. I want to say lastly, that we need to think about the children and put all of our children first. And what concerns me is people that are so against this are adults. They're not thinking about the indigenous children. We have an epidemic of suicides with indigenous youth. I work with them intimately. And you know why many are suicidal? Not just the systemic genocide and systemic racism, but because they feel like their lives don't matter. They feel erased because they see statues of Columbus around the continent. They see other things that show them that white, white folks are, are the most important. And I'm mixed, so I can talk about that. They feel like they don't belong. So when we talk, have this discussion, we best put our biggest responsibility first, our society's biggest responsibility, the children. And if any, if people don't, you know, I don't, I, I know you all will, but shame on whoever is not looking at the kids. Lynn, thank you so much. Um, it's 6.09 and I'm wondering, I deeply apologize for the fact that we've sort of run out of time. Um, I'm wondering if we should make a hard stop here. We need to make a stop here. And um, with deep apologies to everybody who had too short a time, we will, uh, uh, depending on how this vote goes, we uh, uh, imagine that there might be many more chances to weigh in uh, in a deeper fashion. And I think there's been a lot of uh, input from various uh, uh, people today um, suggesting that, uh, you know, two minutes is hard to uh, make work uh, and that we'll look for some ways uh, in the future to have a, a deeper conversation um, in particular um, should uh, we vote on a motion uh, to continue this with a full public review. So I would now open it up to commissioners who may wish to make any comments or ask any questions uh, or bring up any points. Um, we have about uh, another 10 minutes in the meeting. Um, so uh, let's have a conversation and see where we are. I'm just curious about the fact that um, this is not something we uh, ever approved back in 1979. Is that 
affect what we're doing or being asked to do one way or the other? We've consulted with uh, Corporation Council and they've told us that as it's on city property that we would still need to um, review it as part of our purview. Are there other questions or thoughts from commissioners? I thought I heard some very compelling comments from both sides. Um, and I, I think I'd like to hear more. Um, so I would, I would hope that we continue the discussion um, sometime in early September. Yeah, I think for me, it just uh, makes me realize how much I don't know in terms of the history of the city and, and the nation. You know, you think you know history, but then when you dig a little deeper, you find there are layers and layers underneath. And I think for the sake of uh, the entire city to investigate this a little bit more makes perfect sense. Other members' comments? I would also concur with that. I feel like, uh, there's a lot for us to uh, explore, for staff to explore, for us to listen to many more people. This was a very abbreviated meeting. And again, that's, uh, I feel like we should apologize to the public who spent their time with us today and didn't get much chance to talk. Uh, and so maybe if we do determine that there's a, a next phase, we should consider um, having a subcommittee that would propose a format that might work better. I would also agree that we continue this conversation um, into the next meeting. Um, but I have two comments that I just wanted to make. One, um, we heard from Bernie Sapiens, Ienza, sorry if I mispronounced your name, about a book by Charles Mann, 1941. Uh, the same author wrote a wonderful book, 1943, about things that happened after Columbus. Um, mm -hmm. And both of those books are, are worth reading. Um, my question is, at this moment, has anyone done a, uh, analysis of the existing statue and is it repairable or was it broken beyond repair it's very seriously damaged and we've been looking at uh working with conservators to uh do some assessment on that okay so the answer we don't have an answer yet we don't have a final report but we have been reaching out to conservators on that okay that's it um, also, in terms of, I would, I, I think that we're ready to perhaps somebody might be ready to make a motion. Um, my suggestion is that we don't be time specific yet, um, that it would be helpful to have staff weigh in um, with when meetings would best occur. Um, uh, should we determine that we want to go forward and, uh, and have a, a formal public review of the Christopher Columbus statue. I would just add, Mark, before we, before we move on from the discussion, I think, um, it would be good, I don't I necessarily think we need um, endless subcommittees of the BAC, but I do think we need to think a little bit about what the meeting formats look like for this and how to change, how to change this from the two minute testimony to people sharing more and how we build out a list of stakeholders and voices to bring into that in an intentional way. So um, I would just add, I think we need to touch base on that ahead of the September meeting, if possible, even if it's just to start to sketch something out. Because I also know that there's gonna be, you know, for every meeting that we have where there's public testimony, there's gonna be expectation that we are doing something with that. And I just want us to be like really transparent about kind of where we're headed and how that process is shaped. So I would just encourage us to, um, to touch base in between the meetings and, and sketch that out. Okay, I, I would agree with that too. Yeah. Would I have a question? I think it's important to know what the condition of the statue is and when the report is done. I think that would, would be important for us to know before we take any kind of vote. Um, I was just thinking um, if, if this next gathering, should we vote that way, doesn't occur at a BAC meeting, but is its own separate forum where it wouldn't have the restrictions of having to go through all the business and all, all of that, how would we be able to communicate with the people who are here today to make sure that they know about it? Uh, do we have emails, um, 
what would be the best way to make sure that we stay in touch with the folks that took the time to come today and, and testify? If we scheduled it outside of our regular meetings, like if we had a, a special meeting, then we could do it without all the business. I know um, for those of you who are here for this portion of it, the beginning of the meeting was probably pretty long and I apologize, um, but we could certainly schedule a special meeting. And we, find that we need more than one meeting too. I'm not sure that, I, I think that's why I agree with uh, Cara that perhaps we should um, uh, enlist a group to determine a, an appropriate process to follow. Again, assuming that we vote to continue our process today. Michael, I just, I feel like you asked a question and we, and we didn't answer. What was your question just now too? Are you asking me? Or someone else? Michael. Michael, Michael Canizzo. I was wondering when the report was going to be ready from the conservator to know what the condition of the statue is. Um, Trisha, I know you had reached out to one conservator and you were following up with another. Have you been able to do that yet? Uh, no, we don't have an official report from either conservator, but um, we can definitely have it ready before the next meeting. Because I think it'd be important for us to know what what are we actually voting on? I mean, is, is it possible to even restore and save the statue or is it beyond repair that it, it needs to be removed? You don't want it back, please. <laughs> I agree with Michael. I think we need to first figure out what the situation is before uh, we, we can project the life of this and make a vote. But that being said, the fervor is real and we do need to have further discussion nonetheless. Well, certainly the, the final discussion of voting what to do with it could happen after, we could make sure that that report is available before we make that decision. I, I think we could still make a decision tonight um, as to whether, given the testimony we heard today, the passions on um, from more than one viewpoint, um, that to me, it seems worthy of uh, initiating a, a full-on public review of this, this statue. So I, I just wanted to follow up on the question that I asked about being in touch with the folks that are here today. Uh, can they share their emails or how would we make sure that at least they are included and know about whatever happens next? So I think one thing we can do, um, actually, can. Trisha or Sarah, can you share the link to the public comment form on Columbus? And we can make sure that if people are interested, they can enter their emails there and then we can email that list. That would be great. And it, that's also on our, on our website. But um, if we're able to share that in the chat, um, and we can distribute that other ways too, if people um, aren't able to see it in the chat today, they can email us at bac at boston.gov and we can get that to you. Um, and we can also, um, you know, share that out um, in other ways as well. The chat is disabled. Um, okay. It has been disabled for a while now, yeah. Okay, hold on. So if you go to, if you go to the, um, the, uh, the public meeting page for the meeting that we had today. Um, the agenda has the link to that. Um, can we pull that up? It was on the actual, if you go to boston.gov to the public notice, then it's there. Are we not able to just um, turn chat back on? moment so if you guys want to let me give this give me one second and I can try to pull this up I can I believe I can use the chat yeah sending out a test yes, yes. all right So I just need that 
link. Here, I have it. Okay. Does that work? Yes, yeah, so if everybody could copy, if you see the, um, the link in the chat, you can just copy that uh, into a browser. Uh, and then you should be able to submit a form and we'll keep you in, posted on uh, the next steps of this process. Could the caller that said, we don't want the statue back, identify themselves? And not remain anonymous. Are you referring to the comment that was a partial comment after we were done with the public testimony? Because I don't know that we know what that caller was saying. Yes, I didn't. I wasn't watching yeah. the recording that closing to see who whose name was highlighted. Uh, I I don't know that anyone actually caught the comment because we are no longer in the public comment period. Okay, so I think what we're in need of I now is I did that because it was a um, is, uh, Does any commissioner want to make a motion? And remember, we can work through the motion in a couple of steps if we need to. Mark, you've been very articulate about all of this. <laughs> I'd like to ask you to make a motion. Okay, I move um, that we initiate a process to study the future of the Christopher Columbus statue, uh, engaging the public in a robust way, um, including establishing a, a group within the commission that will determine an appropriate review process. And I will second that motion. Does that cover, Cara, does that cover everything you were? I think so. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Um, I'll read off uh, for votes, Aqua Holmes. Yes. Uh, Camilo. Yes. Michael. Yes. Cara. Yes. George. Yes. Bob? Yes. Uh, and I'm a yes as well. So we have a motion passed um, and that this conversation will continue. Um, I have to say uh, that I think that no matter what happens at the end of the conversation, these conversations that we had around the emancipation group were also extraordinarily thoughtful and uh, engaging and learning experiences for me and I hope for many others on the commission and in the public at large. Um, so I hope that by establishing this process, we will hear from many people, uh, we'll hear many voices um, and that we'll be able to determine um, the best direction to move. Now this may take us several months. I think we should be honest up front um, that we wanna establish a process. There may be multiple meetings. Um, and we want to give time for people to make public comment uh, as well. So we look forward to all of you who spent your afternoon with us today. Um, we really appreciate your time. We appreciate your input. Uh, and we apologize for it being so quick um, at this stage. But we hope to have a stage where you can more fully uh, share with us your thoughts. OK. Um, with that, we can move. Uh, to the final step, which is a motion to adjourn. I'm willing to make a motion that we adjourn this meeting. Okay. Do I have second a second that? Okay. Camilo, second. Uh, all those in favor? Uh, Bob? Aye. Cara? Yes. Aqua? Yes. George? Yes. Camilo? Yes. Uh, wait, did I miss somebody? Michael, yes. Oh, Michael, thank you. You disappeared. <laughs> uh, and Mark, uh, yes. Uh, so motion passes. We're adjourned uh, until our next meeting. Uh, again, thank you, everybody. Thank you, the staff, for, um, you know, I know these are complicated meetings for uh, staff to manage. We really appreciate all the work that you're doing at this time. Thank you all so oh. much.
Thanks hey, all. Everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Equa, yes. will we see you next weekend? Yes. Good. Did you get my invite? I haven't gotten an invite from you. I have to send it to the whole group. Okay. Uh, I'll do that next. Uh, yeah, it's going to be a great week, too, weather-wise. Yes. I'm looking forward to that. You doing any cooking? I've been doing a lot of cooking. Okay. I know where you live. <laughs> <laughs> you do indeed. We'll work that out. Awesome. Awesome. You guys. Have a great rest of the week, you guys. I'm gonna Thanks, Equa. See you all. Thanks, Equa. Bye. 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 Hey guys, I'm just seeing if um, Karen can actually come back in for a second. It's very interesting. We have a lot of people in the